So I think it's pretty safe to say that there has never been a time in any of our lifetimes when business has faced the velocity of change that it faces right now. Part of that is technology, uh, big data, the connectedness of everything, artificial intelligence, and the speed at which that's transforming pretty much every business in every industry. Part of it is the political trends, the, the backlash against globalization, which was the driving force for the global economy. Uh, for the last three quarters of a century. And part of it is the extraordinary rise of, of, of China uh, and the role that it's playing in world affairs. So what we're going to do now is talk about all three of those trends with a very distinguished uh, uh, panelist of, of business people uh, that I want to bring out now. Uh, first of all, the uh, chairman and CEO of HSBC, Stuart Gulliver, uh, and then the uh, chairman and CEO of Lenovo, uh, uh, Yang Yongqing, and uh, the, C the founder and chairman and CEO of Hill House Capital, Zhang Lei. Uh, and I think we're gonna have an interesting discussion. So gentlemen, please come out now and let's get going. In retail, potentially our competitors are verticals in, in, represented by fintech companies and platforms. If you look at fintech companies, what they tend to do is come in and disintermediate a particular activity, be it mortgage lending, credit cards, payments, etc. And so it's in that area that banks face um, the Skype moment that long distance phone calls um, did to the phone companies. In other words, long distance company, phone companies used to make, sorry, look, phone companies used to make 32 billion US dollars a year from long distance phone calls. Skype comes along, they make nothing, and Skype makes its money from advertising. So banks face that revenue hit in things like retail FX, payments, et cetera. So there's a revenue impact. What I don't think there is, is a situation where the banks will be replaced, because I think all of the bank CEOs are enthusiastic purchase of fintech capability, because the fintech industry almost represents a supermarket to purchase from. So you know, we have adopted facial recognition technology, vocal recognition technology, um, all of this kind of stuff, and uh, machine learning and so on, we've purchased from outside. So opportunities there. But the big other threat is the cyber piece. So again, yeah, banks yeah. are more targeted by cyber criminals for the same reason they've always been targeted, because that's where the money is. So actually, clients expect to have total access and total security. That's quite hard to pull off. But you, you have to, as you buy into this fintech technology, you have to be willing to dramatically disrupt yourself. You to have recognize to. that things may, you may be able to do things at half the cost or a quarter of the cost that you used to do. So it's, are banks ready to do that? I think banks have to do that to survive. We have to evolve at pace. I think there'll be less people working in the banking industry going forward. And I actually think in retail banking, and I'm being specific about retail as opposed to wholesale, the revenue pool will be smaller. So therefore, it's almost self-fulfilling that you have to adopt at pace this in order to get your cost base down. I, I want to come back to the people uh, problem and the jobs problem in a minute. But first, why, why you're in the technology business. Yes. But what do you see as the two biggest changes that technology is going to be bringing to you in the next five years? Uh, Sorry, I need to switch to Chinese. Please uh, do. Feel free. So, uh, uh, no other technologies uh, could be um, uh, exerting more impact over companies like uh, AI or intelligence technology. AI is translated as, as an artificial intelligence, but I would like to prefer uh, I would like to prefer call it augmented intelligence. Because uh, intelligence is to increase uh, or augment people's intelligence, AI. That's the purpose of AI, not to replace. And uh, with the uh, uh, internet getting more and more popular now, uh, the computer, uh, laptop, as well as cell phone, you can use them, access uh, to the internet anytime, any place, anywhere. And more and more smart devices uh, uh, start to occur in the market as well. For example, the wearable uh, devices could uh, monitor your health, and smart speaker could be interactive, uh, um, could have interaction, uh, interactive uh, question, uh, uh, conversation with them. And more and more uh, household appliances are getting smarter and smarter. Autonomous uh, driving is not only these, but also there will be more and more commercialized IoT, uh, as well as uh, smart devices um, will be developed 
monitoring the um, uh, road situation and transport situation and production line uh, operation, as well as the safety of the society of each individual of us, and also sensing uh, the uh, temperature change, environmental change. So these um, IoT uh, will be developing very quickly, and the data generated, uh, therefore, will of large uh, volume. So these data, together with the data generated by the uh, ERP traditional system or education uh, industry uh, generated data, combined together is what we call the big data. And big data will become the um, um, sources of input for art art artificial intelligence or augmented uh, augmentation intelligence. And uh, computing uh, capabilities getting powerful and powerful. Not only the speed of the computing uh, could uh, timely reflect each um, progress or process or the uh, 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 each process uh, development of the uh, um, uh, reality, but also the uh, cloud computing uh, could also facilitate that. So that's the uh, uh, drivers for the uh, intelligence. With these two areas getting more and more mature, uh, intelligence could be applied to different industries or sectors, not only smart home, and smart office, but also it could be anywhere. Take uh, Lenovo, for example, as a manufacturing company. In our industry, in each process, each step of process uh, of our industry, you can see the uh, intelligence from the development of products to supply to the market, uh, um, to marketing, to manufacturing, to services. For example, in the past, when we develop a, a certain product, the engineer will do, uh, will make the, uh, would uh, des make decisions in the lab. But now, we can uh, collect the um, uh, feedback of the uh, customers of the uh, products in the past uh, through social media or through other approaches. Uh, we uh, will uh, decide what the next generation products will be re uh, redesigned. And um, the best example could be uh, shown in the uh, uh, process of manufacturing. The most difficult thing is uh, to do the prediction of sales. In the past, it was only out of nowhere. People just uh, think a certain number. But now with the uh, big data analysis, including uh, our historical sales data, as well as today's uh, uh, feedback, uh, uh, social media feedback of each and every uh, product of ours sold, as well as those um, uh, data related to the selling in the uh, supermarkets or other uh, department stores, we could uh, very uh, accurately predict uh, the future one month or mo one quarter demand of our products. So this uh, helped us a lot uh, to balance the supply and demand. Very good for Lenovo, shouldn't it? Definitely, uh, definitely, yes. <laughs> definitely. So, uh, yes, uh, including the service uh, as well. In the past, uh, if there is a problem uh, uh, with our product, then they will call us and we will manually handle that. But now 50% of the uh, complaints or questions uh, from the users are uh, answered or handled by the machine because they're asking similar issues, repetitive issues or questions. So uh, artificial intelligence or augmentation intelligence in the future not only will change Lenovo's uh, business process in a very revolutionary way, but also it will become uh, the overall strategy of uh, Lenovo. We don't have other strategy, OE, AR. So our major business is not uh, is now PC and smartphone. So in the future, we'll develop a more. Uh, that's the basis for us to develop more uh, smart devices, including smart office, smart home, as well as uh, 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 commercialized uh, IoT devices. In our database uh, data center uh, business, it is basically a computing power. Uh, part of the a major part of the computer power. So not only the supercomputer, uh, our supercomputer is leading the world. Uh, we are the one of. Uh, we have uh, 87 uh, supercomputers uh, uh, in among the top 500 supercomputers in the world, and also our storage devices, storage system, are widely used in the uh, uh, cloud computing and internet companies uh, database center. So that's. 
the, our strategy. You're in a somewhat different position because you're an investor. You get to choose what industries you want to be in. So where are you? Where do you see the opportunity to make big bets? Thank you very much. I'll also touch upon the uh, issue related to innovation. In the past uh, decade, Hill House uh, inv investment in China um, indeed invested a lot of in innovation companies. So th we call these uh, companies, uh, call those companies, companies of the um, uh, scientific innovation 1.0 era. So it is basically business model innovation, be it uh, Baidu connect to human and information, Alibaba human connect to human and a commodity, and Didi connect uh, people and uh, mobility and made one people and uh, service at the end of the day it is a marketplace it is a, a marketplace a connection business model innovation so maybe next time uh, when the uh, version uh, 2.0 era comes uh, the innovation will be extended to even further areas and uh, innovation will help with those uh, traditional lagged behind and marginalized business or companies or people so that they could uh, catch up uh, the train of uh, uh, innovation. So I'm really excited about this. How can we use the science uh, technology to empower the traditional company? That's my uh, why I'm, what I'm interested in. The major investment recently is uh, in a very 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 traditional company. Uh, Bai Li uh, is a women women's shoe and sports shoe uh, retail uh, retailer. You know that uh, retail companies, retail industry has been uh, totally beat, uh, beaten by the uh, high tech company. So, according to the financial report, in the past three years, uh, by Lee's uh, um, financial report have been declining uh, consecutively three years. So, we would like to use the technology to achieve a growth for them. How can we do that? First of all, technologies are well and better prepared. What does that mean? So let's take uh, A refers to, a, we'll use A, B, C, A, artificial intelligence, B, big data, C, cloud. So we use A, B, C. Uh, development has uh, laid very solid foundations so that we could have the opportunity to make uh, these uh, traditional retail companies to shorten the distance uh, between them and the uh, tech company. So we believe uh, innovation 2.0 would be more inclusive uh, and warm-hearted innovation. Not only it, it, it will encourage in innovation, but also it will change the role of uh, innovation from uh, 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 destructor into a equalizer so that everybody could develop in an equal way. So as a control holder, uh, after by uh, investing in Bai Li, now there are 120,000 employees. OK, the traditional approach is uh, leverage plus uh, cost cutting and lay off the worker. That's what, what we did. So after buying this, uh, investing in this Baidu, we made this pie bigger and making making these uh, 120,000 employees more efficient. So we have uh, 8,000 of uh, 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 80,000 uh, for retail shop stores. So these uh, employees uh, are the best UIs. How can we provide a better experience to the customer by uh, connecting these UIs, by using technologies to empower them and to incentivize them? That's something I'm really interested. I'm really excited and passionately devoted myself into it. Well, you're, you're, you, it actually reminds me of our conversation with Jack Ma this morning. You're talking about a very optimistic, beneficent view of this technology future where the poor little corner shoe store is going to be empowered by the technology you provide it to become more productive and, and more wealthy. But, but Stuart talked about fintech eliminating jobs in the banking industry. YY talked about artificial intelligence and smart factories that ultimately will lead to the elimination of jobs, why should we think that technology uh, isn't going to leave people out of jobs? Because I feel that um, we have to answer this question. Uh, do we want this uh, technology, including, including augmented intelligence, do you want uh, do you want the top one person become a uh, superman, or do you want to uh, help those 90% uh, of the people uh, to decrease the, um, the um, to minimize the digital cap? 
And I think we need to do both. We want um, technology be become more innovative, and, but we want uh, the traditional be more uh, innovative as well. So I think um, job is, is a fulfillment, uh, is a person's ful ful fulfillment, and it's a dignity. And can we do that uh, by using technology? And we, when we look at the store uh, clerk at a shoe store, um, they can use, um, they can um, manage about 20, um, um, 20 things uh, or 200 things because um, they don't have to do it, a lot of things uh, manually because they're using technology um, uh, storage and then they can put a lot of uh, things on cloud and let him know that he can change it. He can help the consumers and uh, what's best for us. And we have already experiment and some 3D scans. And we can, three, uh, we can scan the, the high heel, 3D uh, scan the high heel. And can we uh, help them uh, to see that? This notion that the next wave of technology is going to create more equality rather than widen the inequality gap. Are, are we on the verge of a great democratization of technology? I think it depends on how it's applied. The reason that it shouldn't. Um, so, so if you take sort of the banking industry, there's a lot of logical repetitive tasks which are absolutely easy to, to basically replace with um, machine learning and replace with robotics. There's incumbent on us to X the general turnover a bank like ourselves has every year to retrain people and upskill people. But actually, in most large companies, certainly in the banking industry, and it would be probably true of most companies in the room, you've probably got a 10% staff turnover every year anyway. So actually, if you look at it in those type of contexts, I don't think any of this results in dramatic headcount reductions as a binary act. It'll happen over time. Now, you could also argue that actually by reducing the sort of cost price of a lot of activities, you, you will actually have some kind of democratization benefit. So, so if I take just wealth management, in the banking industry, post the financial crisis, the sale of wealth products has been a highly risky task for a bank because obviously, historically, you relied on individuals to give advice if that advice turns out to be bad and you can't prove that the person explained 12 years ago exactly what might happen. The bank is likely to be fined. It therefore prices the products to exclude, frankly, most people other than the very, very high net worth. You take a client through a automated questionnaire online and you test the same series of questions about what are your monthly outgoings, do you realize this thing could go down, what would happen if it did, how many dependents have you got, etc., etc. You are actually pointing out to them the risks. You are doing it at a very low cost price. You therefore are making, if you like, investments in places that have self-directed pensions, so the United States, Australia, places like that where people save and invest for their own sort of future. You're actually, I wouldn't use the word democratizing, but you're actually opening up much better investment processes to them than you could do with very expensive individuals and with the risk of regulatory fines against it. So, so I, don't, I wouldn't see it all as a dystopian kind of plus or minus black and white type of equation at all. It's much it's, more complicated and nuanced than and, and how you deploy the technology, yes. I guess. Yes. Uh, I think we, we don't need to say that, or we don't need to, we need to worry about uh, AI, that it's going to replace human uh, labor. Um, I think AI is created by human, so uh, we already experienced that uh, in the past that many employees were in the uh, production line. Uh, after the automation of production line, uh, we went to the call centers, and uh, when they use our um, when they use our products, uh, they see some issues, and we need call centers to answer these uh, questions. And now. Uh, the call centers, uh, half of the calls are answered by machines, and half of them, where did they go? They went to an IT department. So we are using IT to, to realize this whole process, uh, to realize the automation of this process. So the computing uh, algorithm, and I think that's the uh, the basic uh, of and the most important part of it. But it's not uh, just from uh, out of nowhere. Oh, but we need our uh, own logic to realize this 
uh, computing or to this um, algorithm. So when we um, uh, investigate algorithm and when we do algorithm, we all need people. So I feel that I am very optimistic about this. I know many people and um, many manufacturers in the U.S., they come to U.S., but uh, the, the unemployment in the U.S. already decreased. So it means what? It means uh, the high-end uh, industry is changing and it's moving. I want to add one point. I think um, Storm, Stewart and, uh, and YY, they are very uh, optimistic and also agree, them, agree with them. I want to add a couple points. Um, although, ultimately, we, we, need to, we can solve this problem. Uh, we know that the technology revolution is at a very uh, fast speed. Um, it's not, it was not like historical uh, uh, revolution. It took years or decades due to the uh, revolution. But, um, but then I feel that we need something more. We need some conscious capitalism. Uh, when you uh, make investment as an entre entre entrepreneur, you, you need to um, encourage business uh, models to spread technology, to become a creative uh, disruptor and become an equalizer. And I think we, it requires conscious um, technology in ways that empower people as opposed to in ways that displace people. Is that realistic? Uh, I feel that everyone um, wants KPI. I, I don't think it's contradictive, and I think it's giving all these uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a blue ocean. We have different place to go. We want to, we want um, to help these people from the bottom up. For a minute about globalization. I mean, Stuart, you run a bank that operates, I don't know. 68 countries. That's a lot. <laughs> 68 different countries. Uh, and yet we are seeing this rising nationalism, particularly in, in the West, a backlash against globalization. Do you think it's over? Um, so, so I was re reflecting with some colleagues earlier. So we've been doing globalization since 1865. Um, and it waxes and wanes <laughs> over that period, actually. You know, history would suggest that just before the First World War was a peak of globalization that tailed off for quite a long time. I, I actually think that, no, I think that, that actually some of the fractures that we've seen um, and some of the populist um, backlash to globalization, perhaps not well informed, perhaps seen as rival nations being able to gain benefits through trade agreements, et cetera, when in fact a lot of it's the automation we've just been talking about that's yep. removed jobs, as opposed to anybody's free trade agreement, has created a tension that I don't think does go away that quickly. What we have done with an HSBC, though, is, is trying to position our bank around what we see as actually a growth of regional trade areas. Mm -hmm. So we may be at a point where globalization is, is not necessarily going into retreat, but is it slack water Stalling. for a while? Yeah, yeah, it's a slack water for a while. But we actually think regional grows, so inter and intra regional grows dramatically. So things like in this part of the world, Belt and Road, RCEP, um, will actually drive inter and intra regional trade between the countries in Asia Pacific and China. Yeah. Yeah. ASEAN will continue to flourish. The GCC will continue to flourish. The EU, notwithstanding the fact that the UK is exiting, continues to flourish as an operating trade block for 600 million people. And others would have a better view on the future of NAFTA than myself. But there will be some form of regional trade agreement linking Canada, the United States, and Mexico. So I kind of see us organized around five big regional trading blocks. And I think those actually will increase their intensity and, and actually increase their logical fit together while we're in this period where, frankly, there's discomfort around some of the traditional, if you like, global trading blocks that have yeah. existed. Uh, YY, you, you obviously made a big bet on globalization when and you are personally an example of globalization. You hop back and forth between the U.S. Yeah. and China. But, but you're facing some real headwinds in the U.S. now, aren't you? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, could be uh, overco uh, overcome. 
uh, so actually, uh, we operate in uh, 160 countries. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, I feel that, Ellen, uh, your question, you asked the wrong person. You should ask the uh, global CEO. You need to ask a global uh, trend. When you add, you, can, you would only get one answer. We support globaliz globalization. We believe in globalization. Why? Because, because over half of our um, uh, business are in um, other uh, markets. Uh, for our Lenovo, our uh, market is in over like 70 other um, 70 other places. So we cannot imagine without globalization. Uh, our 70% of business is somewhere else besides China, and what, what are we going to do without it? So I believe globalization um, CEOs, they are all supporting uh, globalization, and they are very confident about globalization. Uh, for uh, Le Lenovo, I think we are a very good role model for globalization. And um, not only our 70% of business are in um, overseas, uh, we also have a good policy. We have a global local policy. Uh, that means that uh, we, want to, we want our overseas markets to be uh, localized. So no matter where we are in the world, we try to or we utilize the uh, local resources, talents, because we believe the local uh, talents, they understand their domestic markets, and they understand the domestic um, culture. So um, Ellen, you just mentioned that uh, there is um, anti-globalization movement, or the trend, also, especially after um, President Trump uh, became the, the president of the United States. So I feel like uh, that in the uh, US or in Europe, uh, we, we face some troubles or we face some issues, but, um, but uh, there are a lot less um, severe than what we see in Latin America. Um, for example, in Latin America, uh, we have to pay heavy tax. Uh, when your uh, company is globalized, you have to um, get used to that, uh, that country's uh, climate, and you have to have that ability to do so. So, in fact, uh, I just mentioned that uh, not only in the U.S. or in Japan or in India or in Brazil, in these countries, we feel that we already build our um, production base. And we not only have a production base, we have R&D base. So uh, we can uh, utilize the domestic uh, resources and talents so that, so that we can face uh, these uh, anti-global movement. So uh, we, are, uh, we, we are localizing in each market in each country. So I think um, we want them to think that we are a local company. So um, I don't... I think it doesn't matter whether it's globalization or anti-globalization. I think we can all uh, can face the issue. This is our strategy. Uh, I have a question for this panel. Let me turn then to, to the issue of, of China and China's growth. An extraordinary two decades, steady growth, fair amount of debt has built up at the same time. Can it continue, Zhang Lei? I mean, you're, you're making your bets here. Do you expect uninterrupted growth for another decade? At some point, gravity takes hold, doesn't it? I think the China has a huge growth potential in the next step, so it has to be led by the entrepreneurship and innovation. So we can see it in each uh, molecular of the air, in each uh, cell of the blood of everyone. So what is the uh, special feature of the innovation for China now? 
uh, more than a decade years ago, while I was investing in China, the uh, internet and business model innovation, be it B2B, B2B, or B2C, it is C2C, copy to China. That's the basically the model of uh, innovation. But now China is uh, transi tran transitioning from uh, uh, C2C to I2C, innovation to China. So a lot of uh, innovations are coming, of, are coming from China to the world. Even sometimes uh, the uh, booking, on online booking, uh, ticket booking, or Meituan uh, uh, food uh, booking, or online airline booking, etc. So if we can keep this uh, innovative uh, entrepreneurship, uh, so that everyone could fully use their potential, I believe in China, opportunities are only beginning. Bets these days. So, so we've we are very committed to. Uh, We've been very committed to China. So on, on the innovation point, our, one of our IT innovation hubs is in Shenzhen, because actually we think the Chinese fintech um, is more advanced than the West. So actually we're going to pick up better ideas and greater innovation here in China than we will if we're on the West Coast of the States as it stands at the moment. And if we look at where we're sitting now, we think the Pearl River Delta is a huge growth area. Um, you know, you're looking at a conurbation, Guangzhou, Foshan, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, of about 50 million uh, people. So think Tokyo, Kawasaki, Yokohama, big conurbation. Per capita GDP is where Hong Kong was in about 1993. Um, High-tech industry um, and a very young demographic. So, no, we're very bullish. I mean, we're, we just signed an MOU a moment ago to establish a, an HSBC university in Nanshan. And tomorrow we sign the opening of our securities JV where we have 51% ownership of a national securities JV in Qinghai with the Qinghai Development Authority. Now, we employ about 14,000 people here. That will be continue to grow year after year. That's just in the Pearl River Delta, not in China overall. And, and I think we're at the base level yeah. So, so, so yes, percentage GDP growth will slow simply because the GDP number will get big, but that's just arithmetic. You know, the reason yep. the U.S. grows at three percent, we all think it's great, is because it's a multi-trillion-dollar economy. So, so yes, don't get don't get confused by the optics of the arithmetic changing. But this still, I think, is one of the biggest investment opportunities for the next twenty years. Uh, it's interesting you're saying the investment opportunity is not just China, but particularly in Guangdong and the Pearl River Delta. Yeah, I think the Pearl River Delta within China, and and the. The, and the, the Beijing government you know, announced this Greater Bay Area push, which looks for an integrated push for Hong Kong, Macau, Guangzhou, um, and that will be executed on. The other thing that we can all take absolute certainty in is China executes on its five-year plans. Um, and, and therefore, I think as a business environment, the opportunities are huge. Yeah, why, why, where are you placing your bets? Which of those 160 countries? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> No matter where it is, China will always be our home base. So we need to um, focus on the market and win the market in this win this market. Uh, and China is different from uh, past. We're not only the uh, manufacturing center of the world, but also innovation, a part of the uh, most important part of the innovation of the world that, uh, as well. So in the past. A lot of the technologies were in imported from outside China, even though, even to today, semiconductor industries, uh, uh, for example, China uh, Union Pay is going to import around uh, 30 million uh, uh, value of uh, semiconductors. So China is still part of the world's uh, uh, innovation. But meanwhile, uh, you, uh, the world should get used to the fact that there will be more and more innovations from China. So innovations will be from China to the world. And uh, for example, recently uh, we developed a AR headset. The first market targeted market is U.S. market for that product. So our innovation results or achievements will be from China to the world. I also heard that uh, Facebook uh, launched some uh, uh, new features. Uh, actually, those features have already been realized or launched by the WeChat and also uh, cell phone payment, mobile payment. In China, it's already very popular and very uh, advanced to compare with the rest of the world. So I think um, the world should get used to the fact that China will become the uh, part of the innovation of the world.
Yesterday, uh, we at Fortune held our first ever Brainstorm Tech International uh, across town at the Four Seasons Hotel. Zhang Lei uh, spoke there, a number of you attended. And one of the fascinating things about it, we pulled together 15 of the top entrepreneurs from across China and had them to had them present to the group. It was very, very impressive. You'll all get to meet the five winners. Uh, they each won a, a, a Trump chief from Guangzhou Automobile. Uh, and they will be here either tomorrow or Friday, so you'll get to hear from them. But it's clear that there's some fascinating innovation and, and uh, startup activity going on uh, in China right now. Gentlemen, you've done an excellent job setting up the issues for this conference. Thank you for being part of it, and, and we'll dive deeper into each of those issues over the next two days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.